Hello, friends. Welcome back to our series on the Colossians. In this video, we're looking at chapter 3, verses 5 through 17, where Paul gets down to specific uh, activities and thoughts and attitudes that are fitting uh, new life in Christ. First, of course, he deals with the uh, thoughts and attitudes and deeds that are not fitting uh, the new life in Christ. So if you're looking at this uh, this video on Colossians 3, I want to remind you that this video accompanies a post at drdavidalterna.com. I'm making this uh, a video on Thanksgiving week here in the United States. And so uh, in the post, I've uh, related Colossians 3, 5 to 17 a bit more directly to uh, to the Thanksgiving holiday. Of course, Thanksgiving in the Christian life isn't dictated by the calendar, and no one can uh, sort of conjure up Thanksgiving on their own. True Thanksgiving, of course, has got to come from our relationship to God and our our trust in Him. So hope you'll go on over to uh, drdavidalterna.com for that post if you want to think a little bit more in depth about the passage and especially about its uh, relationship to Thanksgiving that we see in verses 15 through 17. So bear with me for just a moment, and I'll uh, I'll get my screen share up, and we'll look at the passage. So when we look at uh, <clears throat> Colossians 3, verses 5, uh, 5 through 17, we're dealing with a passage that puts into practice what Paul has taught us already in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. So the way this passage has often been analyzed by New Testament scholars puts it in what uh, is pictured here on the slide. It's called a chiasmus, a sort of an inverted parallelism that's uh, shaped like an X. What this comes down to basically is that the first and last statements, the statement that if you've been raised up with Christ in 3.1, and the statement in 3.4 that you've died to the old life, are the, uh, the I guess, bookends of the passage. And Paul is here balancing uh, between what God has already done for us in Christ with what he now calls on us to do, activities that fit our new life in him. So if our profession of faith in Christ who died and rose again is a fact, we have been raised up with him to new life. So we should be seeking things that are consistent with this heavenly reign, verse 1, and we should be getting our mind on heaven's program, uh, not the fads and uh, momentary uh, trends of the cultures in which uh, we live. Paul teaches us elsewhere in his letters, <clears throat> and you can check this out and find out that all these things are taught by him uh, throughout his corpus of, of uh, epistles, that we not only uh, died and were crucified with Christ, that we were buried with Christ, that we were raised up with him, and we are with him today as he is seated in glory in his heavenly session at the Father's right hand, and we will also return with him in glory. So if you don't like the chiasmus uh, talk, then this pictures it a bit better, I think. What God has done for us is the bun. He has raised us up with him and through the work of his spirit uh, made us uh, dead to our old life. So the question is, how are we going to respond to what God has done for us? Uh, are we going to really get serious about living in a way that's consistent with our new identity in Christ or not? So that's the beef. So God gives us the bun by his grace, by his sovereignty, by his initiative. He calls on us in the power of the spirit that he's given us to respond, to use the truth of the Bible, to turn our life around and live in a way that's consistent with his, his will, which basically means to, uh, to imitate Christ, to live in a way that is like him. So if I may go uh, just to, uh, to the side for a moment and speak to those of you who are watching the video who are pastors and other, others of you who are teaching the Bible regularly, <clears throat> I want you to know that <clears throat> when we look at this passage, uh, we get help not only in uh, in doctrine of the Christian life, but we get help with uh, homiletics. We get help with how we ought to teach. You notice how Paul is, is balancing here and uh, drawing together uh, what God has done for us by his grace and how we are to respond to that through his enablement. I think preaching can often be one-sided. <clears throat> it can often be one-sided by emphasizing grace without emphasizing obedience. And the opposite is true as well. You have those who are always haranguing the congregation to uh, do what's right, but never really explain to them uh, the grace of God that enables them to do it. So the, the grace preaching uh, leads to a church that's uh, fattened up with biblical truth, well-informed, 
uh, but unfortunately, uh, sometimes inactive and isolated from its community. And sometimes when you have just uh, preaching about uh, the commandments of God and the necessity of obedience uh, without really teaching folks how they're enabled to obey God by the means of grace, you end up with a church that is beaten down and uh, powerless and uh, feels guilty all the time. And uh, that type of church, of course, is not an effective witness in its community either. So I would just say, uh, let's pay attention to the pattern of Paul's teaching, how he uh, he blends together in a very skillful and wholesome way, in a very edifying way, uh, teaching us what God has done for us and how we should respond through the truth of Scripture and the power of the gospel uh, to that. So how does Colossians 3, 5 through 17 fit together? Notice the word therefore in chapter 3, verse 5. Paul has used it several times previously in chapter 2, verse 6, 16, and 20. Chapter 3, verse 1, he's going to use it again in the middle of this passage in chapter 3, verse 12. So the word therefore uh, draws an inference on what he's already said. So what Paul has already said in Colossians 3, 1 through 4 about living for Christ is, is general and uh, is speaking about the principle that lies underneath what he's now telling us in specifics about what we should be practicing. So if we have been raised with Christ, then there are certain vices which are part of the old life, which don't really fit. They're not appropriate for those who name the name of Christ. And there are certain virtues that basically uh, amount to the imitation of Christ that now ought to be characterizing our life. So we have the vices and the virtues, but in the middle of it, verses 9 through 12, we have Paul rehashing what uh, he's already told, talked to us about back in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, where he told us God has transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. And then in more depth in chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, and in chapter 2, verse 20, when he's talked to us about how we have been uh, crucified with Christ and raised up with him. Uh, and so we are now new in him, and there are certain things that fit that life and certain things that do not. So after that reminder about why we should be doing what he's telling us to do, why we should get rid of the vices, why we should add the virtues, he moves to chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, where he talks about the positives. Sometimes we hear from uh, <clears throat> preaching that there's a million things that we shouldn't be doing. Um, it's sort of depressing after a while. What can we do? Well, Paul balances that with things that we should be doing, characteristics that should be in our life. So God doesn't expect us to live in a vacuum. He wants to take all the bad stuff out and put healthy, wholesome things into our life that will make us uh, happy internally and useful in the world and people that uh, bring glory to him. So let's look at more depth at uh, the first part of the passage. Uh, Paul is saying that we need to literally put to death the vices that he lists here. That's pretty strong language. Uh, we need to, uh, shall we say, assassinate? Shall we even say murder these things? Obviously, these are not things that can be murdered. But what Paul is saying, that we died in principle uh, with, with Christ to the old life, but yet these old habits uh, tend to uh, stick around. So what he's saying we should do to them is just put them to death. We should render them powerless in our lives. So what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about thoughts and deeds and attitudes that are essentially in verses uh, 5 and uh, 6, uh, sexual immorality, sexual vices. Then he speaks of covetousness, which is idolatry in the verse 5. He then speaks also of uh, things that need to be put away in verse 8, which had to do with anger and malicious speech, uh, lying. So it's essentially two, two aspects of the old life that he's focusing on. Uh, the misuse of human sexuality, which is a gift of God when it's used appropriately, and the misuse of the tongue. So if you think about James chapter 3, you could tie that into the passage. So these are the things that are no longer appropriate for those who name the name of Christ. These are part of the old life, the life that can be traced back to the sin of Adam and Eve, our first parents. These are the types of things that you can read about in the scriptures. The scriptures don't gloss over these things. <clears throat> the historical books of scripture show us the consequences of people who misuse the gift of sexuality. 
they show us what happens when people are greedy and covetous of other people. And they certainly show us what happens when people are using their mouth in a way that is malicious uh, to badmouth other people, to lie, and uh, to cheat by what they say. Paul te teaches about these types of vices elsewhere in his writings that these things need to be put to death. We've listed some passages here on the slide. But this comes down to the new life of Christians to say, uh, this is not how, how Jesus thought, and this is not how he acted. This is not the life he lived. This is not an appropriate life then for those who call him Lord. Paul then moves on to verses 12 through 17 and uh, talks about the virtues, the virtues that are appropriate. And it's interesting how this list uh, is, is laid out for us here. He begins by speaking about compassion, kindness, how we relate to other people. We probably are not going to be compassionate and kind to other people if we're proud. So then he speaks about uh, humility uh, in, verse, in verse 12. Meekness and patience. He speaks about bearing with one another and uh, dealing with quarrels and complaints with forgiveness rather than escalation. He speaks about putting on love, which is the key virtue, and then about uh, thanksgiving, that if we are... Uh, realizing what God has done for us in Christ and how bad we needed it, humility is not going to be a problem for us. And if we think about how patient God has been with us and how compassionate he's been with us, then we ought to be able to be compassionate and kind and gentle with other people. We ought to be thankful and treat people in love based on what God has already done for us. So Paul has spoken of these things in many other passages in his letters. I've listed some of them here. Uh, things, the virtues that we need to put on in Christ. But it all comes down to, again, uh, this is how Jesus acted and thought. Are we modeling our lifestyle on his or on the momentary fads that are uh, uh, prominent uh, in our world? So we've talked about the vices and briefly about the virtues as well. So what is the point of all this? In general, it is that uh, we become who we are as new creatures in Christ as we unbecome the people we used to be in Adam. Paul sort of looks at human history as having uh, two eras or two eons or two long uh, chapters. We have the Adam chapter from Genesis 3 to the Gospels, and we have the Jesus chapter from the Gospels on. Paul ties these two together in Romans 5, 12 through 21, where he explains to us what happened through Adam is being undone by what has happened to us in Christ. And so he's basically saying to us by this language that uh, we are new creatures in Christ, and as individuals who are new creatures in Christ, we're becoming a new humanity in Christ. So all the vices of the old humanity that uh, are so prominent when you pick up a newspaper today or read a news website uh, these things show us that uh, this is what's going on in the world. But God has acted in Christ in compassion and love on this world to uh, enable us to be better, to enable us to be back in his favor, to enable us to create uh, a culture in the church and in our neighborhoods and in our Christian associations, which is not like the old way of doing things. In fact, when we think about the old and the new in the Christian life, it can be understood uh, both corporately or cosmically, and it can be understood individually. Let's start with the individual. God has made us new in Christ. He's changed our hearts. He's enabled us through the truth of the scripture and the power of his uh, spirit uh, to, to begin to live in a new way. Uh, so the old self has been crucified with Christ. The new self rose with Christ from the dead. So we are new individually. But there's also a sense in which this whole language of old and new can be understood in a corporate way or in a community way or even a cosmic way. Uh, God is changing individuals like you and me so that when we live in this world in our various relationships, our family, uh, our neighborhoods, uh, our workplace, our churches, that we're beginning to uh, create new relationships and structures uh, which are wholesome and happy and healthy uh, for the human race, rather than uh, rather than basically showing how uh, how bad it is. So we need to think of the old and the new not only as uh, you know I'm good, God has saved me, 
but then what am I doing about it in my relationships with my family and my neighbors and my workplace? Am I showing this newness in, in a way that is uh, healthy for the world? And is my church reflecting as one uh, the life of Christ uh, to the world? Here's the left, what life is like in this world before Christ. On the right, what is, what is available to us through him. So we're all too familiar with uh, the old way of life in the world, the sin, the darkness, the death, the alienation, the strife, the guilt, the uh, people who are seemingly enslaved to sin and evil. Uh, sometimes religions come up with a lot of rules to try to stop it, but they don't really work, and people are afraid of the future. Here's what we have in Christ. We have new life through the Holy Spirit. Our life is now a, a life that's been illumined by the grace of God life of righteousness raised with Christ, a life where we're reconciled with God and we can be reconciled with other people, a life of peace, a life of forgiveness, a life of freedom through slavery to Jesus, a life that's based on divine revelation, a life of wisdom, and a life that doesn't fear the future but has a hope of glory. But a life is available to us in Christ. Paul reflected on this in Romans 6, and we're going to tie it into Colossians 3. From the New Living Translation, notice all the red letters. If we died with Christ, that's talking about when we came to faith in him. We were set free from the power of sin, and since we died with Christ, we know we'll also live with him. We're sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. He'll never die again. Death has no longer any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. That's all well and good, you say, but what about me? Well, here it is. You also should consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do you take that seriously? The gospel isn't just what happened to Jesus. It is that. But the gospel also is what is happening to me through what happened to Jesus. Jesus died and rose again. I died and I rose again when I put my faith in him. So as Paul says in the second paragraph here, Sin should not control the way we live. We shouldn't give in to sinful desires. We shouldn't let any part of our body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, we should give ourselves completely, body, soul, and spirit, to God. For we were dead, but now we have new life in Christ. So our bodies should be instruments to do what's right for the glory of God. So what I would want you to think of as the takeaway from all of this is that we're talking about a lifelong process here. This is a, jour a journey. <clears throat> There's no uh, momentary quick fix for what we're talking about here. Found in uh, higher life teaching about the uh, filling of the Spirit. Some people think it's all about speaking in tongues. It's about a, a second work of grace beyond our salvation. Well, I know that there are sincere believers who think this things. I these things, I, I don't doubt their sincerity, their their true walk with Christ, but I think they're mistaken. Success in life, growing in grace, is not a matter of any of these things. It's simply a matter of us taking seriously what God said happened to us when we got saved. Our old life was crucified with Christ. We now have a new life in his resurrection power. We're complete in him, Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7 say. So what we need to do simply is to put down deeper roots and build a stronger house, and uh, walk in him as we first came to know him. God has given us equipment for this journey of transformation. We have brothers and sisters in Christ and Christian community in the church. I hope you're in a church where this is taken seriously, and you're not trying to accomplish it all alone by yourself. Uh, we can be instructed uh, by, by teachers and by our own study as we grow in our understanding of the Bible. We gain wisdom for life. God has given us sacraments, baptism and the Lord's table that we need to participate in. Hopefully you have been a person who has been baptized by immersion based on your faith in Christ. You have been buried to the old life and you have now a new life in Christ as you come up out of the water. When we take the Lord's table, we remind ourselves of Jesus' body that was broken for us. We get a little bit more than just propositional statements. We get pictures that go on in front of us. We touch we taste, we see, we hear, and it's a better way 
of understanding the depth of our life in Christ than simply propositions on a piece of paper. God has given us the Holy Spirit to uh, open our eyes, to, to enable us to live for him, uh, to, to help us be led to deal with life's difficulties. And we can be sure that if God loved us and sent Christ to die for us and put him on the cross, that God has got us no matter what happens. God's providence is real and true. Nothing happens to us that's outside that providence. So as we serve God and live for him day to day, we learn a lot more about how to put this into practice. And we came and we come to a better understanding of what newness in Christ means. And we can relate it to brothers and sisters in Christ who have been down the road perhaps longer than we have and gain wisdom from them as well. So here we have Colossians 3, 5 through 17. If you wonder what a Christian should look like and act like and think like, this passage gives us both sides. We should execute, get rid of those vices that Paul speaks about if we're new in Christ. And if we're new in Christ, we need to add new things to our life, like putting on a new wardrobe, a whole new wardrobe of activities, thoughts, and attitudes that are like Christ, that are appropriate for our life. We can do it through the power of the Spirit. So get out your six-gun partner and execute those vices in the power of the Spirit, truth of Scripture. And get in your closet, put on that new wardrobe in Christ, and live for him properly clothed in this world. God bless you, and let's give God the glory and thank him for all that he's done for us in this Thanksgiving week. See you later.